everybody. hands together give God the best praise that you can give him 
Come on, right there in your home, in your car, wherever you are. Come on, give God just about 30 seconds more of praise. Come on, thank God, thank God for another day, another day where you have life, another day where you have health, where you have strength, another day that you have woken up with an opportunity, opportunity to live, to bless somebody, to be a blessing to somebody, and to give God glory. We're glad that you chose to gather with us here on tonight here at Life Center Church, a place to heal, a place to grow, not just a church. It is a lifestyle. I appreciate all of you who are joining us on tonight. I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to hit that share, like, button. I want you to share it out and make sure that you invite somebody to Bible study with you whenever you're watching it. Sometimes you don't get to watch it on Tuesday night when we're live, but if you're doing a rewatch of it, whatever you're doing, even if you're watching it a second time, invite somebody to join you when you watch this Bible study. Share it out to your page. Make sure you hit like and make sure you follow us so that you can be alerted anytime anything is happening here at Life Center Church. All right, let's run to the Word of God. Let's run to the Word of God. Uh, let's uh, Romans, Romans. We're back in Romans, chapter number three. Chapter number three, and we're going to be dealing with verse 9 through verse 26 on today. Verse 9 through verse 26. Come on, let's make our declaration. I am not moved by what I see. I am not moved by what I hear. But I'm moved by what I believe, and I believe the Word of God. The victory is mine. I have it now, and I can see it through my eyes of faith. Father, we thank you for this moment in your Word and this gathering. We pray that you would bless it, that you, Lord God, would allow it to expand us into who you want us to be and move us forward in our discipleship. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans, Romans chapter 3, verse number 9, beginning at verse number 9. The Bible says, what then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged, both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside they have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of ass is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God set forth as a propitiation for his blood, through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. We've been taking it small chunks, but we needed this whole uh, reading today to get the whole thought. Uh, you could not split it up because it's one cogent thought that Paul is, is, um, is stating. It's one cogent thought that Paul is stating here. And so to get the whole concept, we had to read it all. Paul now, uh, he begins now 
to draw his opening to a conclusion. He, he for chapter 1, chapter 2, for chapter 3, up to now, he is opening up his argument. He is, he is making a stance. He is saying what, what, he, what he plans to argue. And now he's drawing his opening to conclusion. Up until now, Paul has shown that, that human sin explains why the promises made have not been realized. The promises made have not been realized, and Paul, up until now, has been making the argument that the reason that the promise has not been realized is because all man is guilty of sin. What promise? What promises are we that, that have not been realized? Go to Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter 17 beginning at verse number 1. The Bible says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also, I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight years, eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or brought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant, he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So Paul now, Paul says that he, his argument is that this promise, this covenant that we have read with Abraham, this thing that we have, we have read, all the things that I see his seed being blessed to his descendants and to his children and their descendants. These promises have not been realized because mankind is sinful. So the picture that Paul has drawn, the picture that Paul draws, it's, it's really dismal. He says, no one is righteous. No one is righteous. No one uh, has a right to salvation. No one is righteous. So he asks the question. That's why he begins in our lesson, verse number 9, Romans 3. He says, what then? Are we any better than they? Not at all. For we previously have charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands, and there is none who seeks after God. He says that we are deplorable. Not only are we as human beings deplorable, but no one even understands or comprehends how deplorable we as mankind are are who how deplorable we are we don't there's no comprehension and no one is trying to understand or even searching for God who is the source of all wisdom man so we are all deplorable we all have sinned we don't even get it that we're sinners and we don't even search for God we don't try to get an understanding and don't 
That is, it, he, he, he draws and paints a horrible picture. So he says, now we know, Romans 3, 9, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before the God. So he says nothing. He says we are nothing. We are, we are uh, horrible. We are without God. We have completely don't even try to get it. We completely just try to live to our own devices. And he says the law that I gave, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth might be stopped. Now notice, we, we, we jump down because he begins in the previous verses, he is quoting from the Old Testament, just continuing to prove the, the deplorable state of man. Their, their throat is full. Their, uh, their, he talks about no one's steps. They shed innocent blood and, and their steps. And uh, he just begins to to dig into how deplorable man is. And, and, and the, the, the Jews believed because they had the law that they were not deplorable. So he says, are we, all, are we any better? He says, no. He says, what the law does, in verse number 19, the law stops all human excuses. The law stops human excuses. Now we know, verse 19, that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth might be what? Stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Every mouth might be stopped. So every mouth might be stopped. He says what it, the law does is it stops all human excuses. It stops us from boasting in who we are. Why? Because the purpose of the, knowing the law is not to give salvation, it's to illuminate sin. The purpose of knowing the law, the purpose of knowing God's word, the purpose of knowing your Bible is to illuminate sin. It's to illuminate sin. It's to show you where sin is. It's to show you where you are sitting. It is not salvation. The law is not salvation. The law is a flashlight. The law is a, an illumination to sin. That's why he says in verse number 20 of Romans 3, he says, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is what? The knowledge of sin. By the law is the knowledge. I don't know. I would not have known there was sin, the Bible says, had there not been the law. It's like, it's like the speed, speed limit on the highway. The speed limit on the highway doesn't make you a safe driver. The speed limit on the highway illuminates when you are driving unsafely. It does not make you a safe driver. It simply is a rubric to illuminate when you are driving unsafely. The law does not save you. It simply illuminates for you when you are going against God's word. God's word, the word of God, it, it illuminates for you when you are going against his, his, his thinking and his mind. Watch. Uh, go to Romans chapter 8, verse number 3. Romans chapter 8, verse number 3. The Bible says, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but after the Spirit, who do not walk according to the flesh. The righteous requirement of the law. There is a requirement that the law demands. The law demands when sin is illuminated that there is a price paid for that sin. The law could not bring salvation. The law could not bring righteousness because the flesh is weak. What God does is he sends his son in the likeness of sinful flesh and to, to, to on account of sin. In other words, he sends Jesus to pay the debt. 
the purpose of knowing the law is, is to illuminate sin. But when it is illuminated, I realize that I cannot pay the debt. So I can't pay the debt. I am unrighteous. I am deplorable. I am with I I am I am uh, in sin. I am born in sin. I am shaking it. I I I don't even realize how messed up I am. I don't even realize. Really, paints a horrible picture. So so what is the point of all this? What is the point if judgment is all I have to look forward to? If all I've got to look forward to is that I am messed up and there is no hope. What, what is the point if all I have to look forward to is judgment? Romans 3.20 says, therefore by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. No flesh. By the deeds of the law, you got no chance. What's the point? Paul paints such a, a dismal picture, it would seem hopeless and pointless. But thank God Paul doesn't leave us there. He has taken us down this hole of hopelessness, but he doesn't leave us there. Look at verse number 21. He says that no flesh, in verse 20, no flesh will be justified. Verse 21, he says, but now... The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. He says something separate happens apart from the law. Something separate happens apart from that chaos. Something separate happens apart from you just being illuminated that you're wrong. Man, one of the, the worst relationships are the ones that only point out your wrong and never give you any hope. The worst relationships are those that are always, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. Paul has just pointed out the wrong, but he does not leave us there. Paul says that now the righteousness of God apart from the law is being revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So now the law has witnessed that there is some hope coming. The, there is some hope coming. Paul says, I, I, I have put you in this position long enough. I have shown you long, but now I want to tell you that there is hope. Listen, I got to put a pin right there, and I've got to tell you that the church has to be a place to stop leaving people in hopeless places. The church has to stop leaving people in places where they feel like there is no hope. We got to stop just telling people what they're doing wrong, and we start got to start conveying that there is a hope that God has provided in Jesus Christ. There is a hope that God has provided by sending his son. There is a hope that God has provided. You don't have to live that way. There is a hope that God has provided. Apart from the law, separate from the law, something that has nothing to do. God, he has, and the, the law witness to it. The law declares it, that there is a hope in the righteousness that God has provided. There is hope. Young man, young lady, mother, father, sister, but there is hope. No one has to stay in the deplorable condition that Paul has described. There is hope. No one has to stay separated from God. There is hope. No one has to stay walking and fulfilling the lust of your flesh instead of walking after the Spirit. There is hope. He doesn't leave us there. He brings us to a crossroads. He brings us to a, a place where there is a collision. And the judging and saving righteous, the judge, judging and saving righteousness of God. They collide and they meet at the cross. His judgment and his saving righteousness, they collide and meet at the cross. Verse 21 to 22, the Bible says, but now, in Romans 3, but now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. 
even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. To all and on all, watch this, who believe. There is no difference. There is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It meets at the cross. The redemption is in Christ Jesus. So there is a shift from law to faith. There is a shifting to faith. The righteousness of God is manifested in Christ and apprehended by faith. And this apprehension of the righteousness of God by faith is the sole remedy. It's the sole remedy. The cross is the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the cross. The gospel is the sole remedy to this problem of sin. This problem of this deplorable state that Paul has, has declared. The answer and the remedy is the gospel. The remedy is the cross. That's why when he opened up, he, he declared from Romans 1.16 that we are not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation. It is the power. It is the engine. It is the, the force. It is the power of God to salvation. You have to come to the cross. That's why Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. It's a shift to faith. There is a shifting to faith. Acts chapter number 4, verse number 5 says, And it came to pass on the next day that their rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Ananias the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the family of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be judged for a good deed done to the helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which the builders, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which was, has become the chief's cornerstone. Nor is there salvation, watch this, in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men, which we must by which we must be saved because the name is brings the power it is not it is not it is not jesus could have been called they could have called him jesus they could have called him ralph they could have called him. it's the power of the character of who he is it is the power of who he is and when you trust the power of who he is, it allows you to be saved from the deplorable state that Paul has described. It's a shift of faith. Why? The shift of faith is believing that the judgment of God required due to the law is satisfied in Christ. The judgment of God required due to the law is satisfied. The shift to faith is I believe that the cross satisfies the judgment I deserve. The cross does not take away. The cross does not. What the cross does is it satisfies the debt of judgment. Verse 24, Romans 3. Being justified freely by his grace through what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What is redemption? Redemption is the action of, of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for payment or clearing a debt. Redemption, redemption. 
exchange, the, the repossession or possession of something because there has been a payment, the redemption, the redemption, the payment that is in Jesus Christ. The payment. There was, they used to sing a song when I was growing up, I owed a debt I could not pay. He paid a debt he did not owe. I needed someone to wash my sins away. But now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, because Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Being justified freely by his grace. Freely. In other words, I didn't work for it. I didn't do anything to earn it. I didn't do anything to deserve it. It was, it was something that, that all it cost me is to believe. Being justified freely by his grace. Through the price, through the redemption, through the buying back that is in Jesus Christ. Who God set forth as what? A propitiation by his blood. Through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Listen, that word propitiation means the action of appeasing a God, spirit, or person. I want you to get in mind of someone sacrificing to a God. Someone sacrificing to a God. Someone causing a sacrifice to a God. Cutting a bull or a goat or a sheep and letting that blood offering. Jesus became that offering to appease God. Jesus became that offering. How? By his blood. By the shedding. That's why the Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no removal or remission of sins. By his blood. He becomes the propitiation. He becomes that offering that appeases the God. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him. He sent his son to appease the offering required to satisfy the debt so that you could be redeemed from judgment. So listen. He does that, now watch this, to demonstrate his righteousness. Why? Because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Now we're talking Old Testament. See, see the, the cross does not just reach forward, it, reach ba it reaches backwards too. Ooh, the cross does it not just reach to you. We, we, we always talk about the blood shall never lose. It reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley. Listen, it does not just reach forward to you. It reaches backwards to those before the cross. How do we know? Because his forbearance. What is forbearance? Forbearance is the action of refraining from exercising a legal right, especially enforcing a payment or debt. In other words, God says, the Bible says, he winked at sin. In other words, it's not that God didn't care about sin. It's not that God didn't see sin. It's not that God, but God knowing that the cross was coming, God knowing that the payment was coming, God put our sins and our judgment and the debt for sin for those before the cross, he put them into forbearance. Let me see if I can make it clear. If you own a home and you are struggling, the mortgage company can put your loan into forbearance while you get your payment together. In other words, what they do is say, we know that we owe you owe us, but we are going to put your loan into forbearance. We are going to pause collecting. We are going to pause asking for payment. We're going to pause it until you get the payment together. And God, knowing that he was going to send his son, knowing that the cross was coming, knowing that Jesus was going to die for sins, God says, what I'm going to do is I see the sins of you. I see the sins of those that are living. He says, but I'm putting the payment on pause until the payment comes. Until I send the payment, I'm putting the payment on Paul. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. You have to understand that justification 
is imputation. What does that mean? That, that justification is a matter of charging and reckoning. Justification. Justice is a matter of charges being filed and a reckoning. There is no justification if there is just a charge. If there is no reckoning. Ask any family who has seen somebody be found not guilty for doing something to a family member, for, for murdering a family member, for, for raping. Ask somebody who has received a not guilty verdict if they felt justice was served. Justice requires not just charging, it requires reckoning. Somebody had to answer for the sins of man. Somebody had to answer for your sins. Somebody had to answer for my sins. Somebody had to answer for the sins of mankind as a whole. Somebody had to answer. Look at verse 25 and 26 as I close. It says, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. Why? To demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who, uh, who has faith in Jesus Christ. Why did God pass over? Why did God have forbearance? Why did God send the propitiation? Why did God do it? Because God wanted to demonstrate that I am righteous. He says everybody, everybody has a chance of salvation. Everybody has a chance to be saved. Everybody has a chance to believe. Everybody has a chance to come. He says I did not because I knew that the blood on the cross was not just going to go forward. It was not just going to be present it was going to reach backward and it was going to cover mankind's sin as a whole hebrews 9 verse number 16 hebrews 9 my last verse starting at verse number 16 the bible says for where there is a testament there must also be the necessity be the death of a testator or where there is a will there has to be the person who wrote the will that died all right where there is a testament where there is a will there must also necessity be the death of the owner of that will for a testament or a will is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water, scarlet wool, and hyssop, and sprinkled blood on the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled with blood blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified by blood, and without the shedding of blood there is no remission. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. All right? So this is referring to, let me put a pen, this is referring to the tabernacle. When Moses built the tabernacle, Jesus told him to follow what I tell you because he was bringing to earth what was in heaven. He was, he was simulating on earth what was in heaven. And so that's why the scripture says it was necessary that the copies of the things in heaven should be purified with these. With what? The blood of bulls, the blood of goats, with the hyssop. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. The blood of bulls. If you go on in Hebrews, it says the blood of bulls and of goats could not, could not, uh, could, could not satisfy. Because these are heavenly things and not earthly. They, they, it had to be a better sacrifice. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies, which are copies of the true. But into heaven itself. God did not go into what Moses created. God went into what Moses copied. 
Let me say that again. God did not go into the copy. He didn't send Jesus into the copy. When Jesus shed his blood, he didn't take that to the copy. He didn't take that into the temple. He took it to heaven, to the original. But into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself Often, as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another, he then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once and at the end of the ages, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He says, Jesus didn't have to die every year. Jesus don't have to die every year for your sins. Jesus doesn't have to die every January. Jesus doesn't have to die with your New Year's resolution. Jesus died once and for all. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this to judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Listen, Jesus equals the answer. He is the justifier of the one that has faith. He is the justifier. Once and for all, his blood has been shed as an appeasement because of judgment. His blood has been shed as an appeasement. And he has taken, and when he went back to heaven, he took that sacrifice right to the throne. Judgment and salvation converge at the cross. That's why the songwriter said, at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my soul rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight, and now I'm happy all the day. John Calvin said this. He said, justification is the main hinge on which salvation turns. Justification, the fact that Justification required a reckoning, and that reckoning is Jesus Christ. It's the hinge on which salvation hangs. Today, you need to realize that Jesus paid a debt so that you don't have to fit into the description that Paul has so vehemently described. You don't have to be deplorable. You, the, the deplorable sinner that Paul has described. You don't have to live outside of God. You don't have to live outside of Christ. Christ has made a way for you to be free. Christ has made a way for you to receive salvation. At the cross. But you have to meet him there by faith. By faith, you have to trust that the debt's been paid. By faith, you have to trust that the charges have been answered for. By faith, you have to trust that Jesus paid your debt. If you trust that, if you trust that Jesus paid it, if you trust that, that Jesus uh, uh, reconciled your redemption, if you trust that, then today you can ask him, you can acknowledge it, and by faith you can receive that justification. By faith. By faith, you can receive salvation. All you have to do is receive it. And if you're ready to do that today, there is a prayer line at the bottom of your screen. There is a prayer line at the bottom of your screen that you can call and somebody will pray with you. And right at this moment, salvation can come to you. 
The debt's been paid. He's already done it. All you have to do is receive it. Father, I pray today that someone who didn't know has heard. I pray to you that someone who did know has been reminded. I pray that someone who couldn't explain it can now go explain and tell their friends that Jesus died for you. Father, let this word go out and not return void today. Let it produce new believers. Let it produce new uh, converts. Let it produce, Lord God, so that your name might be glorified, your name might be justified. And Father, today we thank you for those who are going to receive you by faith. We thank you for what you did. We thank you, Lord God, for paying the debt. We thank you for, for freely, by your grace, redeeming us. For we didn't deserve it. We didn't earn it. We didn't work for it. But you did it anyway. And we say thank you. Father, let no one walk away from hearing this lesson, not taking advantage, not, not, not tapping in to the free grace that you have given. I thank you for those that are believers, those that are going to become believers, and those who are going to take this lesson to create believers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you, my brother and my sister. God bless you. I am so glad that you are here on today. Listen, it's offering time here in the sanctuary. It's offering time, if you would, if you would. There, it's right there on your screen. Find a, an avenue or, uh, to give, and as you find an avenue to give, I pray, Lord God, I pray that you would continue to be a blessing so we can come into your home, so we can come into your home. God bless you. God bless you. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll see you on Sunday, whether in person or online, as we continue walking through the book of Ephesians. God bless you. Have a blessed night and share the gospel with somebody that needs to hear it.